Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today we join Andrew recorded live on location at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park for the 2015 Summer Family Bible Conference. And now here's Andrew with today's teaching titled, Dwelling in God's Presence. Prayer is not an opportunity to inform poor misinformed God of your situation. And yet we do this all of the time. This is amazing to me how they are saying, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Don't you know what has happened? Man, Jesus knew. He not only knew what had happened in the natural, he knew what happened after he died. He knew what had gone on for the last three days. And so um, he said, what things? And they began to say in verse 19, they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, Mighty indeed and in word before God and all the people. You know, they were willing to call him a prophet, but they had backed off of him being the Savior of the world, which they had made that confession. They said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, in uh, Matthew chapter 16. But now they'd backed off that confession because of the results that they were seeing. And in verse uh, 20, it says, And how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. You know, the way they're talking about this is in the past tense, that their faith back then was this, but because of the death and the, res and the burial, uh, their faith had been shaken. And they said, and beside all of this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. That's talking about Peter and John who ran to the sepulcher and went in and um, found that the body was gone and saw this vision of angels. And then in verse 25, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Boy, there is so much in this. I have meditated on these verses thousands of hours. I just have to say some things and let you go flesh it out. But this is the resurrected Jesus. He is perfect. And he came to them to reveal himself unto them. He came to them because he loves them. He was trying to bless them. They were distressed and he came to help them. And yet here's the resurrected, all compassionate, loving God speaking to his disciples that he's trying to help. And he says, you fools, you're slow of heart to believe. Did you know that there's just a bunch of people, I'd say the majority of people today, that they would never say things like this because it's not sensitive. You're insensitive. You're being unkind. You got to be sweet and kind. Here's the resurrected Jesus saying, you fools. Slow of heart to believe. There was no malice in it, but they were foolish. He had prophesied to them 14 different times that he would be crucified and resurrected again. 14 separate times. And did you know that the unbelievers, the scribes and the Pharisees remembered the prophecies about his resurrection? That's why they said, put a watch there because we remember that he prophesied that he would rise the third day and we don't want his disciples to come and steal away the body and say that he was resurrected. The unbelievers remembered his prophecies, but his own disciples had forgotten all of the prophecies about him being resurrected from the dead. That's foolish. And Jesus said, you fools and slow of heart to believe. There was no malice. He wasn't mean, but it was foolish what they were doing. I personally... Maybe it's just because of my personality type. God speaks to you, I guess, the way that you are or the way that you understand. But God has told me before, that's foolish. It's stupid. Quit doing that. I believe God will just tell you things sometimes. There's no malice on his part, but we do a lot of stupid stuff. Amen. God will tell you you're stupid. Amen. You know, we just are so, we become so touchy-feely and so sensitive that if a person says you're fat, you get offended. You got to say, well, you're a little challenged in this area. No, you're just, you're fat. Amen. You're short. You aren't vertically challenged. You're short. Get over it. 
Both your feet reach the ground. You're the perfect height, amen. <laughs> but we got people that are just so sensitive about everything. The way that we, our society is developing to where you can't say or do anything without offending somebody is wrong. You need to toughen up. And a lot of it comes because we won't even let our kids compete anymore. There are no winners or losers. Everybody's a winner. It's not so. Some of us are losers. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to stay a loser. You know, my granddaughter came home and she had a trophy for something. And, and my son Peter said, well, what did you win this for? He says, well, everybody got a trophy because we are all winners, and he took it away from her. He says, that's not true. He says, you aren't all winners. There's some people that do better than others, and I think it's good for you to realize you aren't as good as you could be, and it will inspire you to improve and get better. But we've got people now that you just can't stand the fact that something might be wrong with it. Some of us are just ugly. Some of us are fat, and some of us are just other things, and you know what? You don't need to let it bother you. I mean, paint your barn, make it look as good as you possibly can. But it's the, it's the inner man that counts. There's some of us, there's some people that honestly, they just don't look very good, but they, they are awesome, lovely people. I'm thinking of somebody right now. I won't tell you who I'm thinking about. <laughs> But there's a minister friend of mine that this guy, I mean, he's just homely. <laughs> and yet he's an awesome person and you can see his heart and it comes through and everybody just loves him. Get over it, amen. <laughs> Go get one of those makeovers and look as good as you can and then just get with it. <laughs> but you know what? We, Sometimes the Lord will just tell you things. He's telling you, old fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you know how you get past your reasoning? You know how you get out of this carnal mode? where I don't feel God with me. I just can't believe it if I don't feel it. You know how you get past that? You stick your nose in the Word. He used the Word to reveal it unto him. John chapter 6, verse uh, 63, Jesus said, The flesh profits nothing. It's the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. We put so much emphasis on the flesh. Man, I could spend hours on this, but we are becoming increasingly, even Christians, more and more carnal to where there is a physical, natural explanation for everything. We've now got to where, you know, nothing is your fault. It's your genes. You have a disposition to this, and it's your environment that caused you to be this way and stuff, and we're trying to find a physical, natural reason for everything. Did you know that around 50% of all of the healings that Jesus uh, produced were demons? They were cast out of people. Deafness, blindness, curvature of the spine was called a spirit of infirmity, and on and on and on you could go. Did you know a lot of things aren't physical? That's the reason that the doctors can't really find out how to deal with it because it may have a physical byproduct. It may affect you physically, but there's a lot of things that are spiritual. But boy, you say, if I said this outside of this group, if I was in a secular environment and said some sicknesses are spiritual, they're demons, man, I would be, they'd call me a devil. They'd say, I'm demon-possessed. Our society does not believe in that. They believe everything has a physical cause and a physical answer. That's what the Bible calls carnal. You are a spiritual being, and a lot of what goes on in us is all spiritual, and we are just trying to figure things out in the physical. How do you get out of that? You stick your nose in the Bible that is spirit and its life, and the more you study the Word of God, the Word of God makes you spiritually minded. It opens your heart up. It gives you spiritual eyesight. You see things differently than people that don't believe the Bible. 
The Word of God will make you spiritual if you abide in it. Like it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Word of God will change your attitude, and it will make you prosperous and have good success. I do not believe that you can be a biblical, spiritual person without just being consumed by the Bible. I believe you can be a spiritual person, demonic spiritual. You can be new age. You can sit in a lotus position and go home, and you can have all kinds of spiritual experiences. But you can't get into God's spirit without going through the Word of God. The Word of God is a perfect representation of true spiritual things. And if you want to be spiritually minded, you've got... I mean, if you want to be spiritual, you've got to be spiritually minded. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Spiritually minded is just word minded. He used the word. He went through all of the Old Testament scriptures and showed them the verses concerning himself. And that's how he began to change their perception. Did you know that Jesus was with them the whole time, but it didn't benefit them because they didn't perceive it. They didn't perceive who he was. Jesus is with us all of the time, but it doesn't always benefit us because we don't perceive it. And why don't we perceive it? Because our eyes are holden, we're carnal, we're operating in our flesh, we're trying to figure things out just in our mind instead of letting God speak to our heart and listening to our heart. How many times have you ever had to make a decision and you had these multiple choices and you felt like you should do something, but logic and all of your counselors, every single person told you that's stupid, you better do this, and they counseled you to do that. So you made the logical decision, and it turned out to be the wrong one. And as soon as it happened, what did you do? I knew I shouldn't have done that. You know what that is? That was your spirit. That was the Holy Spirit trying to lead you and yet we just lean unto our own understanding instead of acknowledging him and believing with our heart. You know, one of the classic examples of this in my life was when I was in Pritchett, Colorado, and I pastored that little church. When I went there, they had about four or five elders, but they were all custom combiners, and they followed the weed harvest. And so they were there for a few months, but then it was getting towards the time that the weed harvest came up, and so they were all going to leave, and they felt like that they needed to have an elder there to help me run the church. And so they were going to appoint another elder. And I agreed with that. I didn't have a problem with it. And they all suggested this one guy. And when they uh, suggested him, I said, no, I don't think that's good. I just didn't feel peace about it. I didn't feel like that was the right decision. And, you know, I believe that women are more intuitive than men. Men, they just operate out of their logic. And women do a lot of things on feelings and emotions. But being a typical man, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a logical reason not to put him in. I told him, I said, I just don't feel right about it. And they started saying, well, so what's wrong? Well, he was the first guy that embraced Jamie and me when we came. He treated us nice. There was not one reason in the natural not to make this guy the elder. It looked good. It was logical. Everything about it was good but not everything that's good is God. And so anyway, after a week or two, and he was getting close to the deadline when they left, they just pressured me, and I said, all right. So we ordained him, put him in as an elder. They went on weed harvest, and the very first week, this guy turned into the devil personified. <laughs> he said that I was stealing money from the church. He accused me of committing adultery, accused me of doing dope, getting drunk, sexual immorality. I mean, he accused me of everything. He just turned into Satan himself. And when that happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. And I drove a stake in the ground right there. And I said, you know what? From now on, I don't care how logical something looks. If I don't bear witness in my heart, if I don't feel peace about it, I'm not going to do it. And I, I probably haven't done that perfectly, but I really can't think of a time I haven't done that since then. I mean, I, to the best of my ability, there's been times when, there's no reason I shouldn't do something, and I don't do it because I just don't feel like it. 
I don't feel peace about it. You, you can know things by your heart, and the Word of God will sensitize you. It'll make you. You'll get to where you perceive things by the Word and by what it says and by the Spirit when there's no physical proof of anything. For you to dwell in the presence of God, you're going to have to do what this says, and you're going to have to go through the Scripture, and you are going to have to start seeing God with you and seeing how He was with other people. And even when there was things... Uh, going on in the natural. It was what was happening behind the scenes that worked. You know, Jamie and I were in Washington, D.C. a few years back, and I bought the book about Robert, uh, Robert E. Lee, the Confederate uh, head of all of their troops, and I read his book. And it was intriguing to me because the South, for the first two years of the Civil War, the South should have won. They beat the North multiple times. I mean, there was one time where they literally had the northern troops cut off. Lee had given orders that if his orders would have been followed, the South would have won the Civil War. And yet it didn't happen. And it was just miscommunication and one person just refusing to do what he told them to do or there was this mistake made or the, or the uh, communication would be changed. by. I mean, it was weird. And it was uh, interesting. But here's what I'm trying to get at. When I read that, I was so disappointed because it's like reading in the Old Testament when people would go out and they would go to a battle and they would have two and three times the force of the enemy. I mean, the enemy would have two and three times as much as them, and yet they would win. And yet the Bible tells you what's going on in the spiritual realm. The reason was because the Spirit of God moved when the sound went in the mulberry trees, because an angel went out and killed 145,000 people in one night. See, the Bible not only tells you what happened in the natural, but it shows you what's going on in the spiritual that made these things happen. And as I was reading this book, I just wanted so much to know why did these things fail? Why did it happen this way? It shouldn't have happened that way, and it did. And I just know that in the spiritual realm, it was God moving behind the scenes to make the outcome that we have, but I couldn't tell what it was. They were only telling the things that were going on in the physical. And I thought, man, this is so inferior compared to reading things in the Bible where they give you the spiritual stuff. When you read in the Bible, it'll begin to start showing you what's going on behind the scenes. You'll begin to start seeing things differently. And this is what Jesus did. He referred them to the Word. He showed them through the Word. The Word was spirit and it was life. And it brought them out of their carnal reasonings and began to start having them think spiritually. And then it goes on to say in verse 28, it says, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. And there's a great truth here. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but the Lord does not force himself upon you. You know, my mother always taught me that if somebody asks you over, the first time you always turn it down. Because if they were serious, they'll ask you again. They might have just been polite. And I'm not sure that that's really the right way to do things, but you know what? It's kind of the principle that the Lord operated on when he went to his disciples. They were out there drowning. You know he walked on the water to go out and save them. And yet he was out there, and yet he would have passed by them if they hadn't yelled at him. Man, if it would have been me, I'd have come running, waving my arms, hold on, guys, I'm coming. But man, he just goes out and shows himself, and then he's cool. He just walked right on by the boat. And if they hadn't called out, he would have walked on by. Right here, he, he made as though he would have gone further, and they had to constrain him to come inside. God wants to be wanted. He will not force himself upon you. He's a gentleman. He will reveal himself to you, and, but you have to lay hold of him. You have to say, God, I am not letting you pass by. I'm going to grab hold of these truths. And it says, But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them, just like he did three days before during the Last Supper. And I believe that as, they, as he did that, you know, it didn't mention that they saw the print of the nails in his hand, and yet he was breaking the bread and giving it to them. But it says that he blessed it and break and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him. 
and he vanished out of their sight. As soon as they knew him by the Spirit, as soon as they finally perceived by the Spirit who this was, instantly he was gone. You know what? Knowing God by the Spirit is better than knowing him by the flesh. And again, most of us would say, oh, no, I want to see him. I want to have the glory cloud. I want to see something. It's a greater faith to operate in knowing him by the Spirit. And the moment that they got into the Spirit, the moment they knew who he was, he was gone. Do you know, God's with us, and we wished we could see more and feel this and have a goose bump, and oh, God, you know, I heard Kenneth Hagin talk about that he had fire jump between his hands when he laid his hands on a person, and we want these physical things and stuff, and God can do that. He does do it. He has done it. But the greatest faith is when you just operate in faith. As soon as they saw him, they vanished out of sight. And it says how that he was made known unto them in, in breaking of bread. Let's go on and read this. In verse 32, it says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Man, that is one powerful scripture. Jeremiah said something similar in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. He was so, he had been persecuted so much, thrown in prison, beaten, and all these things. He says, I'm not going to speak anymore in the name of the Lord. I'm not going to say this anymore. He got tired of being persecuted. But he says, but his word was like fire shut up in my bones, and I couldn't forbear. I tell you what, the word of God, some of you have, know what I'm talking about. Others here may have never experienced this. But I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen many, many miracles. The greatest thing that has ever happened to me in my life is the Word of God just coming alive and God speaking to you and having God's Word burn in your heart. It's awesome. If you have never experienced that, you are missing out on what I consider to be the greatest thing. I tell you, the Word of God coming alive on the inside of you is absolutely awesome. Everything you see right here is because of the Word of God burning in my heart. That's awesome. They said, didn't His Word burn within us? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. It's in communion that your eyes get opened and that you really see the Lord. You have to have the foundation of the Word of God. you got to have this Word burning within you. But then it's as you take what the Word has revealed to you and you commune with God and you talk to Him and you speak back to Him His Word. And you say, Father, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. It's as you're in communion with him that your spiritual eyes are open and that you actually make connection with him. Well, that is powerful. And brothers and sisters, there's just a lack of communion with God. Most of the time we're operating in our flesh and we do so many things that just heighten our flesh that lock us into the physical natural realm and make us spiritually dull. This is our newest construction update. I'm standing on the roof of our brand new building. We have actually two layers of some type of insulation and then they put different layers of plastic on top of it and then eventually this white cover and this is the way the roof will be. So they are starting from the north end and they're working south and the plans right now are to have the entire roof on by the end of October. Now we're down on the platform in the auditorium. They're putting on the roofing and they're putting all of this metal up first and then they'll come back and then they'll pour all of this flooring back here. But we are coming right along. Uh, as far as the finances on all of this, we have made all of our payments, which is a praise the Lord. I want to really thank those of you who've helped us. This is our first week of school here at CBC, and I tell you, we've had a great response. We have over 700 people here. By the time our midterm enrollment comes around, we're anticipating we're going to have at least 800 or more people. So there really is a desire 
and a need to get this done as quickly as possible. Also, with all of the parking in the winter here in Colorado, it would be wonderful to have our 1,085 space parking garage. We have plenty of room for those of you that would like to share and to be a part of this. But praise God, it's coming along to the glory of God and we're getting it done. It's all debt free. We've now spent, I think it's over $12 million on this second building, $32 million on our first building. All of it's been done debt free. Praise the Lord and thanks to all of you, our partners. This album is available as a live teaching from the 2015 Summer Family Bible Conference on either CD or DVD, or in a DVD album as seen on TV. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount. The third audio teaching in today's series is titled, Knowing God Heart to Heart. It's available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD free of charge. This is the last day we'll be offering this teaching, so be sure to respond today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Join me on January the 28th through Saturday, January the 30th at our Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, Colorado. And this is what we call our annual men's advance. There have been men's lives totally changed. We spend the afternoons just visiting and the main thing is we share the Word of God. Women, you ought to send your husband and your sons to our Karis Bible College Men's Advance January the 28th through the 30th right in our facilities in Woodland Park.